All right, we've been talking about um, different conditions, different ways that they get their nutrition and their energy, heterotroph, autotroph, chemotroph. Now, what we're gonna delve into is the different types of environments that microbes can flourish in. And we talked a little bit about this previously, but now we'll get into it in a little bit more depth. So when we talk about their environment, we're talking about a niche, right? And a niche is simply um, an area that an organism has adapted to in order to make that its habitat or its home, right? Um, and the things that affect whether or not a niche is hospitable or not to an organism uh, is whether or not it can carry out one of those fundamental characteristics of life, which is to uh, undergo metabolism, right? So if it's too cold or it's too hot, that might limit an, a microbe's ability to undergo metabolism. All right. So temperature is a factor. Oxygen is a factor. If it's an anaerobic microbe, it can't process oxygen. And oxygen, although it is vital to us and, and, and many living things, oxygen is toxic. Now we have ways to process that oxygen, but not all microbes do. The pH, if it's neutral or if it's acidic, or if it's basic, that is going to restrict or allow certain microbes to live in that environment. Osmotic pressure, bar barometric pressure, all these conditions allow microbes to seek out their own niches. And sometimes the microbes will adapt because there's no room in the niche that they are used to and so over time, they'll evolve and adapt, and that will allow them to now seek up residency in areas that they may not have been able to previously. So the three cardinal temperatures are gonna be minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and optimum temperature, all right? Minimum temperature is just gonna be the lowest temperature that a particular microbe can grow at. Maximum temperature is going to be the highest temperature that it can grow at. And then optimum temperature is gonna be the temperature that it grows the fastest, right? So each microbe is gonna have its own set of these three cardinal temperatures. They're gonna have a range that they can survive in and then a particular temperature that they thrive in. If it's a psychrophile, that's going to be a microbe that thrives and prefers lower temperatures, okay? So anywhere from zero to 15 degrees Celsius, okay? Which that's cold. Um, a mesophile is going to be in the middle somewhere. 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. And we all know, right, that the human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So these are the types of microbes that can be pathogenic to humans because they survive in at body temperature. A psychrophile isn't going to, to um, be a human pathogen because it's too hot for them. Not all mesophiles are, um, are human pathogens though, because this is 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. So that's in the range of, of room temperature basically. And that's what encompasses, I think, the largest swath of microbes. They're gonna be mesophiles. Thermophiles are going to be the ones that thrive in greater temperatures, right? So they like higher temperatures. Okay, these are going to be the extremophiles. Extremophiles just mean they like extreme conditions. Okay, 
So those are your three temperature adaptation groups. Be familiar with those. Psychro, cold, meso, middle, thermo, hot. Um, gas requirements. So as I mentioned, oxygen can be toxic to certain life forms in terms of the fact that they are, there are these reactive oxygen species, right? Or ROSs. And that can be just oxygen gas. It can be a superoxide. It can be a peroxide. It can also be hydroxy radicals, these OH groups. And most cells have enzymes that can neutralize these ROSs in the form of superoxide dismutase, certain catalases, certain peroxidases that break down these reactive species into things that aren't toxic, okay? However, not all microbes have that because microbes were around before oxygen was a, a primary large component of life form metabolism. Okay, before that, microbes thrived in an anaerobic environment. Because remember, microbes have been around for a long time, right? 3.5 billion years. And so many of them still are living in that ancient realm where oxygen was not a prevalent gas in the atmosphere. If you're an aerobe, that means you can use oxygen. You do have these enzymes that detoxify that ox these reactive oxygen species. If you're an obligate aerobe, that means you have to have it. You're obligated to have oxygen. If you're facultative anaerobe, that means anaerobe, you don't use oxygen, but you have necessary enzymes in place to, to um, detoxify it, okay? And then micro aerophile, micro small aerophile like, so only a small amount of oxygen is required, right? And we'll use these terms obligate and facultative in different ways. And so just know that obligate means it has to be done. Facultative means it's more of an option, okay? So when we talk about obligate parasites and facultative parasites, obligate parasite is, has to have, it's a parasite. So by being a parasite, it has to have a host, okay? Anaerobes, as I said, do not use oxygen for metabolism. There are obligate anaerobes, right? That means they lack the enzymes to detoxify oxygen, so they cannot survive in an oxygenated environment. They need to be anaerobic under anaerobic conditions. Aerotolerant anaerobes are going to be those that do not utilize oxygen but can survive in it, okay? So, a facultative anaerobe is going to be one that um, utilizes oxygen um, but can grow in its absence. Aerotolerant anaerobes do not use oxygen but can survive in its presence. Okay, so there's those are switched. Don't confuse those. You know the difference between aerotolerant anaerobes and facultative anaerobes. Um, if we are going to, yeah, I don't know. Um, sorry, if we are going to study anaerobic microbes, we have to have special ways to incubate them, right? Because oxygen is is everywhere, right? So um, 
There are ways to do that. In the early days, they would just take a jar and close it off and light a candle. And through combustion, you end up utilizing all of the uh, oxygen and then you have in its place a CO2 enriched environment. And then you'd put the tubes, uh, have your, your growth, your growth cultures in that jar and they can now grow. Um, and that's going to be an example of a camp no file. Okay. It grows best at high CO2 concentrations, higher than what we normally see in the atmosphere. Okay. Neutrophiles, as the name implies, right? They grow at a neutral pH between six and eight. Acidophiles are gonna grow at a lower pH where it's acidic. Alkalinophiles are gonna grow at a higher pH where it's alkaline or it's basic. Osmotic pressure, right? Osmophiles require a high concentration of salt or halophiles, which we mentioned, I think last week, we talked a little bit about halophiles. Obligate halophiles, those are going to be, because it's obligate, they have to grow in solutions that have higher concentrations of salt. At least 9%. Okay, which is, I believe that's higher than the salt concentration in the ocean, I think. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Does anybody know the concentration of the ocean, the salt concentration? No? Okay. Well, these are going to be things that grow in, I, I believe, Mono Lake, if you guys have ever been there, has a lot of salt, and so... It, it's inhospitable to a lot of different types of life. And um, however, it does have some of these halophiles that thrive there. Osmotolerant, they don't require high concentrations of solute or salt, um, but they can subsist in those types of niches. And then facultative halophiles, they are resistant to the salt. It doesn't mean that they uh, need the salt, right? Because they're facultative, but they can survive in that. And, and Staph aureus is an example of that. And I believe it's because of the, they have these um, pumps that, are, that allow them to pump out this excess salt so that it doesn't um, essentially uh, make them want to uh, boil up. Pressure, all right? So barophiles, they can survive under extreme pressure. And actually, they'll blow up if they're exposed to normal pressure. So these are going to be your deep sea bacteria and organisms, you know, the ones that are thriving at the bottom of the ocean subject to extreme pressure. And then um, water. Uh, only dormant dehydrated cell stages. So spores and cysts can survive desiccated environments, right? And we talked about the endospore and that forms when the bacterial cell, the vegetative cell is no longer in a favorable condition, one of those conditions could be such as a dry environment. And if it's super dry, then they'll form these spores, which is an adaptation to, um, to survive it, but not thrive it. Okay, so let's see if any of that um, made sense. The, um, Chlamydomonas nivalis grows on Alaskan glaciers and is a photosynthetic pigment present that gives the snow kind of a red crust. And I'm sure 
even in the Sierras, uh, if you look around, sometimes you'll see um, a reddish color on the snow. Um, so these types of organisms that grow in extreme cold would best be described as what? Psychrophile. Psychrophile, yes. All right, because psychrophiles um, have, they demand colder temperatures. Alkalinophile, that's going to be, right, a higher concentration of, or not a higher concentration, but a higher pH. And um, a microaerophile is going to be something that only needs a little bit of oxygen. Osmotolerant is going to be something that can tolerate osmotic pressure, but doesn't require it. And a barophile, as we just mentioned, is going to require higher barometric pressure. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Now, when we talk about the niche that microbes live in, Okay, go get something to eat then. I'm, I'm teaching right now. I'm doing my Zoom, okay? Sorry, guys. Um, when we talk about niches, oftentimes those niches have to be shared, okay? And so when a niche is shared by two different microbial species, there's going to be some kind of interaction between them. And it can be symbiotic, or non-symbiotic. When it's symbiotic, they're going to live in close proximity and you know they're going to share or or take nutrition from each other. But both of them have to be involved in some state. And so mutualism is going to be a form of symbiosis where both members benefit, okay? Commensalism is a situation where one species benefits and another species is not harmed. And when we talk about symbiosis, it has to be different species. If it's the same species, then it's just, they're just being social, right? That's just a community. But when it's symbiotic, it's two different species. Parasitism is where one benefits and another is harmed. Okay. No. No, that's an Asian pear. Um, close the door, please. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and then we'll also talk about amensalism, which is the fourth type where one is harmed and the other one isn't benefited or um, harm, you know, harmed either. So uh, non-symbiotic is a form where organisms are free living and they're not required for survival. They just inhabit the same niche and are on their own program, okay? So syntrophy is where um, you can have these members that cooperate and share nutrients but they don't have to be together in order to, um, to make that happen, right? It's just, it's just a co-op. Where amensalism, um, as I mentioned, some of the members are, are harmed, but it's to no benefit of the ones doing the harm. And this is kind of, there's going to be kind of some redundancy with this in the way that it's presented, but um, just to kind of dial it in and, and, and drive it home. Mutualism, both members benefit. Obligate mutualism is that they are required to survive. So the example that they give, and this is a pretty common example, the jellyfish Cassiopeia and dinoflagellates have to come together. And a lot of coral also 
have to have symbiotic relationships with cyanobacteria because the cyanobacteria and the dinoflagellates are photosynthetic. And by being photosynthetic, they give sugars to the jellyfish or to the coral, and which also gives the coral its pigment. And in return, the Cassiopeia jellyfish and the coral provide a home for these dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria, respectively. And so that's why when we see rising temperatures of the ocean, we see a phenomenon called coral bleaching. And I guess it's not a phenomenon. It's a, it's a, a very well understood process. It's where the water gets too warm for the cyanobacteria to survive because they have that very specific temperature threshold. And so they leave. They leave the coral. The coral can't leave. The cyanobacteria can. And so as they leave, they take with them their color, which, gives, which is what's giving the coral its color. And that's why it's, it bleaches. So those are things that have to come together. Non-obligate mutualism or I think you could call it facultative mutualism, um, are, mutu are organisms that can be separated. So the cilia foreign, it's a ciliate, which we'll actually talk about later because ciliates can be microbes, um, have a mutualistic relationship with green algae. The same reason that the Cassiopeia jellyfish and the coral have mutualistic relationships to get sugars but these ciliates don't require that algae. They can get it on their own. Here's an example of an obligate mutualism relationship. Um, roots on a legume and bacteria inside those roots. They live together, the roots give them a home the bacteria help them absorb different nutrients. And so they each benefit from each other. And if you take the bacteria out, it, it cannot thrive outside of that particular environment. The roots can't extract the nutrients that they need. And so both things perish. Here is the Cassiopeia jellyfish uh, with an, a, an insert of the magnified dinoflagellates and again, you can see it gives it that orange color in this case, and they live together in harmony. You take them apart, both things will perish. This is the ciliate, and you can see the little green unicellular algae inside it, which helps it out. But again, if that went away, the ciliate would still be fine. The algae would still be fine. Okay, but they do come together because it makes life a little easier. And all things want to make life a little bit easier, right? Here's an example of a fungal hyphae. A hyphae is just like a, um, like a projection, like a protrusion from the fungal cell. And in this case, it's... Um, having a mutualistic relationship with a grass leaf. Um, again, what makes fungus not a plant? They can't photosynthetically, they, they, they're not photosynthetic, right? And so the fungus gets sugars from the plant and in return, it helps provide nutrients to the plant that are non sugars related. And there are a lot of fungi, we'll talk about fungus later, but there's a lot of fungi that have this symbiotic relationship with the root system of plants, mycorrhizae. And they, again, they get sugars from the, the plant and then they give nutrients to the roots. Commensalism, again, one benefits, the other isn't harmed or benefited. It's just kind of an innocent bystander. Parasitism, one benefits, one is harmed. 
and here are just some some examples. This is commensalism, um, and it's showing this this white swath here. That's a, just a streak of Staphylococcus. So, quick question: If it's Staphylococcus, what kind of bacterial shape and arrangement is it going to be? Anybody? It's going to be round, right? Round because it's caucus. And it's, then multiple for strapho. I don't. So staff, like staph. staff. It's either staff or strep. And strep is easily to me. I can think of it because it's like a strip, so like a chain. Where staff is a cluster, so like a grape-like cluster. So these. Um, so this staphylococcus, if you were to take a sample of that big long streak and put it on a slide and, and dilute it out and look at the individual cells, they would be round and they would clump together. And so this is an example of hemophilus colonies. So they are these, these little circular colonies that are, um, that are in proximity to the staph. And, um, what they do is they get certain growth factors that the Staphylococcus strain produces that they need, and then um, and then they can thrive. But they don't harm or benefit the staph. Okay. And hemophilus. What is hemophilus? What do you think that means? So Phyllis like file right it likes something what's that on what is that what is the background blood blood that's a blood auger plate so hemophilus means that those microbes like um like a blood environment okay they like hemoglobin Here's another commensal. It's a, this is the Demodex. And I think I talked about Demodex in that first week when we were just talking about microbes broadly. The Demodex mite lives on our faces, in our follicles, and um, there are certain bacteria that also live on our skin. And they get, they eat our dead skin cells and they get nutrients from us, but they don't really harm us. They don't cause any pathogenicity by hanging out in our hair follicles on our face. They don't cause acne um, like other bacterial species do. Parasitism, think viruses, right? That's, a, that's an example. Viruses really don't benefit us much. I have mentioned that viruses have been very important in evolution, but the ones that insert their their genome into, into other organisms' DNA. And so they've shaped evolution in some ways, which I guess could be argued that have, has been beneficial. But for the most part, on an on a, on a individual to individual basis, not a species basis, viruses are not beneficial. And they have to have a host, right? They cannot live on their own. So it's parasitism. Malaria, that's a parasite, right? Um, it has to have a host. And it's the plasmodium that is the parasite. It has to be in blood, okay? And so it travels in the blood of one animal into a mosquito, and then the mosquito deposits that into another animal. Any questions so far on this, guys? I'm sure this is kind of a review for a lot of you who have had other biology classes because, you know, again, um, these are relationships that aren't just applicable to microbes. Um, so chances are you've had, had this symbiosis talk before. Um, Non-symbiotic, right? They just share a habitat. Syntrophy, as I mentioned, they just share it uh, and they 
they release certain substances, um, growth factors or nutritional byproducts that are good for you know, another species there and vice versa. However, amensal, amensalism is where one of them is secreting something that harms another nearby organism. And so um, typically that is, you know, it, in the book it says that um, it can be used uh, as, a, as a method of, of competition. I don't really like to think of amensalism as that because if it's using that to compete, it's getting some kind of benefit. But really amensalism in its, in its true definition is that um, one of them is harmed and the other one doesn't benefit. So here's an example of syntrophy where one microbe, this um, azotobacter is a, is a nitrogen fixer. And so it releases ammonium, which then is useful for cellulomonas so it uses the ammonium that the azo, azotobacter is releasing. And then it's using that. And then along with that, it's breaking down cellulose, which is, which is a, um, a carbohydrate that if you don't have cellulase, you can't break it down, um, which is why cows and horses eat grass, but, but we don't like dogs if your dog if you have a dog that likes to eat grass like i do and then they kick them for a walk and they come in they throw up a big old grass ball on your carpet that's because they don't have cellulase to break it down and cellulose is a big component of um, the cell of plants anyway that i digress um the cellulomonas then breaks down that cellulose into into that a larger from a larger carbohydrate into a small glucose molecule which then benefits the azotobacter okay it doesn't the azotobacter doesn't have to have it from the cellulomonas and the cellulomonas doesn't have to get ammonium from the azotobacter but as a result of them being together in the same area they get these byproducts okay Again, just the mites feeding off our skin cells. Um, an ant and its um, fungus garden. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, one thing benefits, or I mean, one thing is harmed, the other one does not have a benefit. Okay. In some ways, it can be complicated. In some ways, two species can be mutualistic at some point and amensalistic at other points. Or, you know, it can be mutualistic with one species and amensalistic with another or parasitic to another. Um, the, the plasmodium that causes malaria, it has a pretty, uh, I guess that relationship, it doesn't benefit the um, mosquito, but it's not harmed by the mos the mosquito isn't harmed by it. So that's a that would be a what? One is benefited and one isn't harmed. What kind of relationship would that be? Is that parasitism? Nope. Parasitism is one is harmed and one is one is benefited. So th in this case, one benefits and one isn't harmed. So that'd be co-mensalism, okay? And so to keep track of these, you know, mutualism, that's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory because it's mutual. Um, parasitism, just think of things that are parasites. They're bad for you, right? But they're bad, but you're good for them. Now, comensalism and amensalism, those can kind of be a little confusing, but co, I think of cooperation. Um, they're cooperating and no one's really being harmed. 
amensalism means without, right? A is when you put the A at, at the beginning of something, it means without it. So um, that means one is harmed, but one isn't benefited. So in the case of the malaria parasite, that's going to be a commensal relationship because the mosquito is providing an environment that is hospitable to the malaria parasite and also then providing a new environment when it bites something, but it doesn't harm the mosquito. So it has a commensalistic relationship with the mosquito and then, has, then it goes on to have a parasitic relationship with the host that that mosquito uh, is a vector for. Okay, so like all things biologically related, it gets complicated. Um, this is another example of the amensalism, um, which I won't waste too much time on so that we have enough time to get into some things that are going to be important. Biofilms, right? We've talked about this before. We've talked about what's used to make biofilms, right? Does anybody remember how biofilms are made? Is it peptidoglycan? Is it glycocalyx? Is it endospores? What do you guys think? Glycocalyx? Yes. And so it creates this extracellular matrix, right? This, um, this milieu that connects the cells together and allows them to be protected from the outside environment. And it also allows them to communicate with each other called quorum sensing, okay? So if you look here, this is going to be um, a biofilm right here. Let me do my annotation here so you can see. So this is the biofilm on some animal host or structure. And you have a bacterial cell that is going to use its flagella. Which way does it turn to run? Clockwise. Oh, I think it's counterclockwise. 50-50 chance. And then what's the other thing it does? Tumbles. Tumble, right? Okay. So it's going to tumble and run until it gets to that substrate. And at that point, it loses its motility and it stays in that film. And what it can do is it can then communicate with the rest of the tribe. And biofilms are things that like, you know, the plaque on your teeth, that is a biofilm of a bunch of different bacteria that are feeding off of all the sugars you give it and then releasing acid as a byproduct that gives you cavities. And so let's say the, let's say something, let's say a bacteria uh, is encountering something, some condition, and it needs to produce something. It's going to secrete what they're calling these inducer molecules, okay? So these bacterial cells are saying, hey, we need something. And how do they do that? They secrete these, these signaling molecules that then go into other cells and lead to transcription of a necessary protein that then is produced. And so that allows maybe the secretion of more, let's say as, as more bacteria comes in, they need to make more of this extracellular matrix. And so they just start secreting a bunch of that, you know, or maybe they need to um, start making some enzymes to um, digest food particles. Right, so maybe this is the the plaque on your teeth, and they're like, "Oh, right, we just got we just got some food, 
but we got to break it down. We got to break it down into simple glucose. So um, they'll start secreting enzymes to do that. Okay. It's a really, it's a neat and interesting process. Um, when we think of bacteria, we often think of them as these unicellular things, which they are, but they can come together and, and work cooperatively in, in unison and in a, a community. And they do that by these, these signaling molecules. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip over the um, couple slides. It talks about binary fission because we're almost out of time. And I do wanna get to um, growth. And so growth happens at an exponential rate in bacteria. You take one cell that divides into two, two divides into four, four, eight, et cetera. And so in a very short time, you can go from one cell to many. And bacteria typically don't hang out in isolation. And so you, you have multiple cells that do this doubling event, um, which is why bacteria grow so fast if they have the right conditions and why they evolve so quickly because their turnover rate is so fast that any mutations that, that happen that cause some change happen in, in a matter of hours rather than years. When the conditions are right, the bacteria will go into a state that's called the log phase of growth. And that's when they're, they're essentially growing exponentially. Okay, that is the most favorable condition of their population expansion, the log phase. There are also other phases. There's the lag phase. That's when um, there's very little growth. The exponential growth phase, that's like the log phase where it's the maximum growth. Stationary phase is when it starts to plateau out, right? It's exhausted all of its nutrients. Um, or the environment, as a result of all this cellular division, has released a bunch of metabolic uh, metabolites that are now toxic, okay? And then you get into the death phase where they start to die off. And that can be exponential as well. So this is the diagram I want you to be familiar with, okay? And be familiar with these phases. The lag phase is down here. That is what, that is when there's very little growth, the population is relatively stable and small, and then a, a sudden influx in temperature or decrease in temperature, depending on what kind of temperature that bacterium favors, or, and or the influx of oxygen, if it needs it, or certain nutrients will cause this exponential growth phase, right? Where you have this log phase of growth. And that's- Professor? Um, yes. So the Henrietta Lacks, her cells, they didn't seem to die like all the others. Was that due to good conditions or was it something with the cells that kept them in an exponential growth for longer so for Gila, for the Gila cells they were they were cancer cells and what made them particularly hardy is that they had mutations in the cell cycle checkpoint so that is um, a governance of how often cells will divide and there are like these stop signs right or checkpoints that once you get to a certain um, phase in, in cell division, it says, okay, put on the brakes. We've, we've divided enough or stop dividing um, entirely. The HeLa cells had mutations in those stop signs or those checkpoints so that they could just divide ad lib. 
um, endlessly. So it wasn't, it wasn't so much, I mean, yes, those cells have to have a favorable environment. They have to have a certain temperature. They do have to have nutrients. Um, but what made them so hardy and, and such a terrible cancer is that they just had these mutations that let them divide endlessly under the right conditions. Um, so does that mean, um, well, obviously she had to switch containers with the cells because they were dividing so quickly. Is that still the case today? Do they need to continue <laughs> creating or um, giving those cells new containers to continue dividing yeah. to be current? Yes. Yeah. So if you were to take a little plate and put the HeLa cells in there and you put, usually you put this media, it's either clear or oftentimes it's red uh, because the red has an indicator to tell you when they've exhausted the nutrients. Um, if you just left them in that plate and didn't put them in an incubator so that they were warm, um, eventually that population would just die. But if you give them nutrient, if you continue to give them nutrients and you continue to give them a warm environment, they won't die. I mean, the cells will die eventually, but they will, but, but they will divide in such a way that it's offset. So the population just keeps expanding. And in the terms of Henrietta Lacks, those cells were inside of her. And so there was all the time, there was, it was always warm and there was, there were all, there were always nutrients that those cells could get. All right. But when we use them now as a cell line, you either freeze them down in liquid nitrogen. So that just makes them essentially, uh, um, uh, like they, they hibernate, right? But once you revive them, they do have to have, you have to, you have to put them into new plates with new nutrients. Does that answer your okay. question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so then the, once they've maxed out the, the nutrients in their niche, they hit a stationary phase where growth stops, right? And now they're just hanging out. Some are starting to die. They've exhausted all the nutrients or they're secreting toxin, their waste, right? Because remember bacterial cells excrete waste. It builds up and then it becomes toxic for them and then they die off, okay? So those are the four stages of growth in a population. Um, so it's 1052 now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to continue on a couple more slides that I are, think are important. If you have to go now or if you want to go now, you're more than welcome. Just um, check the video. I'll post it later today um, to get these last few slides. Okay. And if you want to stick around for the next few minutes, that's fine too. Carl, can Will I you be just, did you hear my question? I'm sorry, no. Can I ask you something about the exam on Friday? Sure. Um, are you, is it gonna be like on Canvas, like the like the quizzes are, or is it gonna be something where we need to print it out or? No, no, it'll be like the quiz. Okay. Yep. And then the other thing, someone said something else. Yeah, will we have a study guide or something to go off of? Yes, there was a study guide last week that I that I posted. Um, so there's a midterm prep document in in the last week's folder, and then there's also a page that says midterm prep or something like that. And so that has an outline of everything from each chapter that is you know potentially on the on the exam. So check that out. If you can't find it for whatever reason, let me know. Okay, um, let me get through these slides and then if we have some more questions about the exam coming up, I'm happy to, to field those. All right. Turbidometry, that's how we analyze, that's one way to analyze population growth. Turbid means cloudy or you know thick, hard to see through. And so as these cells divide, they, take up space, right? So when you put a 
tiny amount in, and this is the medium, this is the liquid broth, it's clear. But as the cells divide, now they take up residency and they make it cloudy. And then there are actually these devices that shine light through and will give you an absorbance. And that will tell you kind of like a, a spectrophotometer tells you, you can quantify how many cells are in there. Um, a direct cell count. So you take a little bit of your media that you've grown up and you pipette it onto a grid. You usually have to dilute it somewhat. And then you just count the number of cells in that grid. And then you can extrapolate that out based on the dilution that you did, the volume of your media to determine how many cells are in that growth. Uh, and then flow cytometers, culture counters. I talked about flow cytometry when we were brainstorming, I believe, uh, for our research proposals and just said it's a way where you, you put fluorescent dye on certain cells and then it, it separates them into these bins based on the color. And then that can, it will, so if you have green fluorescence, uh, that can be a marker for dead cells. Or if you have red fluorescence, that can be a marker for live cells. And they'll split out because of their color. And then it will give you an idea of their concentration. So you get an idea of how many cells in this culture are living, how many are dead. Okay. That's it. We made it. Cool. Any questions on this stuff? I just have a question going back to exam questions. Yep. Um, oh God, I forgot. Oh, what, when is it going to open and how long was it again? So it's going to be this Friday at noon and I'm, I think I'll just give you the hour and 35 minutes because that's the, that's the lecture period for that, for Fridays. So um, it'll open at 12 and it will close at 1.35. Okay, thank you. How many questions is it? Do you know yet? No. Um, there are true and false. There are multiple choice. There are fill in the blank. There are matching. There are short answer. There are, there is an essay and there is an extra credit. So um, I haven't finished the, the midterm yet. So I don't know exactly how many questions, but you know, um, probably about 10 true and false. Um, 10 multiple choice, one or two matching, maybe five short answer, one essay, something along that lines. Dr. Franz, you're brutal. Are we going to have a uh, diagramming picture? Uh, later? Yeah, so um, there will probably be some, they're typically, well, you guys don't have to draw anything. So you get off um, on that. I usually have students draw and then label something. So it might be draw a generic bacterial cell and label the following. Pillus, flagella, ribosomes, chromosome, glycocalyx or slime layer, actin filaments. You know, that was something that was on the quiz. So it might be, so in this case, it'll be probably more like, here's a picture, just like on the quiz, there were some of these questions. Here's a picture and you have to label it. And so there will be some like that. And the nice thing is that there are plenty of questions. So, you know, if you do bad on one, you know, if you do well on, on the other stuff, 
then hopefully it'll make up for it. Any other questions? On and just to clarify that extra credit, sorry, did I cut somebody off? Was oh, 10 points or 100 points? <laughs> oh, so um, yes. So th that is a reference to the Eliza Labster. So if any of you guys, I posted it, we were supposed to do it a couple weeks ago, but it wasn't there. So um, I've post, I've, I've uploaded it now. If you want to do it for extra credit, it's 10 points, not 100 points. So if you did bad on a quiz or something, that'll give you, you know, if you got 10 out of 20 on a quiz, that'll give you 10 extra points to, to buffer that, that, that quiz. Um, the extra credit will probably be five or 10 points, not um, 100. The, the, <laughs> the test itself is 100 points, okay? So five or 10 points can, can really bring up your score, can you know, change it by a grade letter. Uh, professor, did you upload the midterm review session? Or did you record it? No, I didn't record that. That uh, was, um, yeah, so that is for, um, that is the benefit of the people who showed up for that. So they got it. And um, if you didn't show up, then yeah, you missed out. Okay. Anything else, guys? I hope, you know, don't stress out. I know that some of you probably have other midterms this week and and uh, hopefully none of you have midterm on Friday as well as this one. But, um, you know, uh, look at your quizzes. I'm, I'm assuming you guys can go back and, and look at your old quizzes that you've taken, right? Okay. Um, that is a great resource for the midterm. I don't want there to be, I don't like to surprise um, my students. I don't think that, you know, I don't like to do the gotcha thing. I don't like to, I, you know, I, I want to give you everything that I expect you to know and then just see if you know it, okay? So, um, so it looks like one says they're locked and you can't get, check the questions I got wrong, okay? So anybody, so, if someone else goes back to their quiz, do they get that same message where they, they can't see which questions they got wrong and then what the right answers are? To them? I can still go look back and look at them. Okay. It just says correct answers are hidden. So you can't, so on, so Christine, on one that you got wrong, assuming you've ever, I don't know if you, maybe you don't get anything wrong, but. I know I do. Oh, you do. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to assume. Um, yeah. If you have a wrong, if you have a wrong answer, does it show you the right answer? Okay. So the first one I looked at, it was something I wrote in. So it wasn't like select one of these. It was, um, so, but it doesn't, so then it wouldn't tell me what the right answer is on that, on the fill in the blank type question. Um, I might look at another one. Okay. So uh, on mine, it, it might be, like, I'm sorry, go ahead. So sorry. I was just saying on mine, it looks like quiz one is the only one that doesn't show you like the correct answers, but the other three did. So I don't know if that's for everyone else too, but that's what I'm seeing. You know, this, this could very well be my, uh, so th these quizzes have all these settings and it might be that I just didn't select the right setting to, to let you see answers afterward. And I'm still, you know, bear with me. I'm still trying to learn this whole online canvas thing. I much prefer face to face. So let me go back. I'll look at the quizzes and see if, the, if there's a setting on my end that will help 
unlock those answers that you got wrong, okay? Yeah, I'll second that. Quizzes two, three, and four uh, provide the answer, but quiz one does not. Okay, all right, good to know, because then I can see what the difference is between those. One, no answers. Two to four answers. All right, good to know. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, I don't want to surprise you guys. Um, be familiar with the stuff we've talked about. Be familiar, look at the, the homeworks and the, the, the quizzes, and that should give you, um, that should give you a good indication of the kind of stuff that will be on the exam. Okay. There might, they'll, I mean, of course, there'll be stuff on the exam that weren't on the quizzes, but hopefully th that gives you, the quizzes are an insight into how I create the exam. Um, I will be traveling down to Sacramento tomorrow uh, for a while, but if you guys have any questions between now and Friday, please let me know. Um, what's going on Friday morning? Anything? Oh, there's no lab because yeah, I don't like to schedule stuff. I don't like to schedule labs when you have a test that day. So um, why don't we just plan on having some, some office, you know, like, um, if you want to schedule some office hours with me Friday morning before the exam, we can do that. Okay. For a zoom. Does that sound good? Okay. No homework this week, I'm trying to keep it light. Um, so unless there are any other questions we can end now, but uh, if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer. I know sometimes when you're on the spot, it's hard to, to think about an answer. But if, if we end now and you start diving into the material and a question pops up, feel free to shoot me an email or message me through Canvas anytime. Um, and we'll just go from there. I have a question about the lab. Um, yeah. I missed like the first two minutes of class and I think you might have said it. But do we have to do it? today or can we do it friday after the exam or the labsters yeah uh i thought we were picking up a kit this week next week okay okay next week yeah okay yeah. so next friday will there there will be a kit okay so we don't have to pick it up until next friday no yes okay. i mean yes you don't okay. yes Professor, I have a question regarding to the lobster. Yeah. I already finished and uh, no, I mean that uh, on the way to finish and uh, I got a gray, but uh, it's almost 90% and the last step I couldn't figure out how to, uh, how to transfer the sample into the first tube and somehow it gets stuck. Is there any other way that I can get the gray with the finishes or I have to finish it? Well, um, no, you don't have to finish it. If you've gotten, if you've done 90%, then maybe you get a nine out of 10. I don't know, what, is it, what does it say your score is right now? My score is um, 76 over uh, 80. But the, the gray, it doesn't, sound, it doesn't show the gray. Because the last step, I could have committed 100% because for the last, uh, the last step, I have to transfer the sample into the fresh tube and yeah. somehow I transfer into the medium tube. I couldn't find out the fresh tube. So I just stuck over there for almost half an hour. I'm sorry. And yes. Yeah, you know, these labsters, I've, I've said it before, um, they are not ideal. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I. I don't do this to torture you guys and make you spend lots and lots of time getting hung up on one little spot. Um, that is a that is a real major caveat of mine to this. 
And the problem with microbiology is that there are three labs. So in order for you guys to get your full five credits for this class, I've got to give you something to do. And we can't just have journal club three days a week. I think that would burn you guys out. So um, unfortunately, the labsters are a part of it. Um, Actually, it's very interesting. I do that. I feel it's very interesting for that, for the, for the labs there. It's just like sometimes we get stuck in some step that it takes a lot of time to figure out how to process, how to continue with that. Right. And, and you know, um, the nice thing about the labsters are that they do give you some hands-on experience outside of the, just me lecturing from a slide. So like when you did the gram stain, hopefully that was a little bit more informative than me just telling you about the gram stain. Um, so I do think that there's a benefit. To, I mean, if there was no benefit to it, I wouldn't make you guys, I wouldn't have this part of the curriculum, but yeah, um, I don't know. If you're really, really stuck, um, just submit it and see. Like if you're 76 out of 80, I mean, that's a, 90, 95%. So, so I, I will try to log in again today to see how it's look. If not, I will send you email you and uh, I will, but actually, but uh, I cannot take the, the, can you see the, the gray on that or no? No, I just checked. There's no, there's no, well, which one was it? The, um, in isolation, no. Bacterial okay. isolation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't see anything yet for you. You don't? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And you know, unfortunately, some of these labs, you have to, there's a really precise way in which you have to do something. If you don't do it the exact way, then it won't let you proceed. And it's sometimes a trivial little hiccup. Um, um, so, I, I will try it again. I will let you know. I will email you if it didn't go through. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Hey, Doc, a lot of times, because I'm a pro at getting kicked out of these things, I'll make it up to like 93%, 97%, and it will not submit until you finish it. But when I restart or reload, yeah. it'll take me back from that 93%, and sometimes it'll take me back to like 85%. So I have to repeat couple sections so there is a way of doing it okay okay um if you i i figured out if you go to the mission and then load to the previous bookmark or um checkpoint or whatever it is it just resets you back to that point and you can redo what you messed up on okay. um so like for um okay Karen, i don't i, I, I yeah. I don't want to mispronounce your, your first name. Um, if you just click back to the um, um, previous checkpoint, it may let you redo that section that you messed up on. Uh huh. Yeah, I will try it. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. Yeah. So I'm not sure because I haven't done the lab yet, but I, in a, it's might, it sounds a little similar. In a previous lab, I pipetted something into a test tube that was the wrong tube and I spent 45 minutes trying to sort that out and move along. What I realized is I had, because there's a set of new test tubes off to your side, but you can't put it in the test tube tray even there, though there's holes for, for it looks like you should be able to until you pick up the test tube you messed up on and throw it in the waste bin. And then you can take a new glass tube and put it in. <laughs> so I don't know if that helps you, if that's the same thing, but that's yeah. what my point found yeah. out. I would try it. It stuck me like for 30 minutes. I tried to do it again. I cancel and I do it again. And then I just lock out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if any of you guys get to that point where you're so close and then you get shut down, do a screenshot or something to show your progress and let me know. Um, I don't want these laps. I don't want your grade to be affected by the labsters. Okay. I'm not, I don't want to give everybody just a 10 because then people just rush through it. You know, I want you to, to give it your effort, but if you give it your effort and you still get hung up somewhere, I'm not going to penalize you for that. So in the future, if you spend an hour on something and you still can't figure it out, let me know. Okay. 
and we'll work yeah. something out. Thank you. Actually, the lobster is very interesting. I like it a lot. Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Some people like it. Some people like it a lot, in your case, and some people uh, dread it. And so uh, it's nice to know that, that there are people that, that enjoy it, you know, not, not um, trading parts, but the, the other if, aspects of it. If I want when it's great already, and if I want to study, can I do it again? Does this affect the grave or no? If you redo the whole thing? Yeah. Like if I have time and I want to see, because sometimes like when I just do it one time, I cannot master the process of uh, doing the, the, I couldn't like, totally understand and I want to do it again. So does this affect my gray? Yes. I mean, I, I, not by doing it again per se, but if you got a better grade on it, if you got a better score, I believe it updates with the better score. Okay. If you get a worse score, um, <laughs> then maybe it goes with that worse score. But um, I doubt you'd get a worse score going through it a second time. Oh, yeah. So in this case, maybe not. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay. All right. Well, um, let me know if you have any questions on Friday morning. And um, if so, we'll set up some time. If not, message me in between now and Friday. And if not, then I'll just see you Monday and good luck on the midterm Friday. Okay, so bye everyone.